Good morning, young mathletes. Today, let's take a look at pi slash circle graphs, line graphs, and stem plots. Um, I'm fairly certain that the circle graphs and the line graphs are not going to be new for you. However, stem plots might be a little bit um, unfamiliar. So we'll start by reviewing first. Um, I have set these up to sort of learn by example. So we are going to consider the grading percentages for your Math 0300 course. Class participation is 5%. Homework and quizzes counts for 20%. Um, exams are 50% of your grade. And the final exam counts for 25% of your grade. Now, I set this one up this way because number one it has a whole bunch of relevance to your current situations but two the percentages aren't too bad so they're easy to graph let's talk about some properties one of the properties that makes circle graphs so useful is that they are great for comparing parts to holes. So they are a great way to get a visual picture of how much your exams count towards your final grade. And I know for me, pictures often make a bigger impact than just reading it in words. The other thing that is really great about circle graphs and it kind of goes into the comparing parts to holes is that the sections of the graph are proportional to the data they represent or to the um, percentages they represent. <coughs> what that means is when you look at the picture for a circle graph, if it says an exam counts for 50% of your grade, then half of that circle will be shaded. That means that if you have a little bitty section, it's not counting as much as something that might take up a quarter of the circle. So let's go and make our circle graph. The first percentage I see that I'm gonna work with is the exams are 50%. I'm picking this one because drawing in half of a circle is pretty easy. 50% is half. So I'm gonna do my best to cut my circle in half. We are not going to pull out a protractor and measure degrees and calculate to the nearest tenth of a degree exactly how big our section should be. We are going to estimate. My exams are 50%, so I'm going to color or shade. If you feel like shading, it is a more academic way to say that you colored it. So my exams were 50%. I'm going to put exams in here and the percentage. Next, I'm going to go and take care of this final exam category. This is my second to largest category, and it's also the next easiest one to draw. It's 25% or one quarter of the circle. So that means I need to take the remaining 50% and cut it in half. So 
So I'm going to shade in that quarter. And label it. Now my last two percentages are class participation and homework and quizzes. Homework and quizzes is the next biggest one. Now if you pay attention to your percentages, if I'm lazy and I just split that last remaining quarter in half, that's going to give the impression that my homework and my quizzes count for the same amount toward my final grade, and that's not true. So I want to make sure that when I divide the remaining part of my circle, it fairly accurately represents how much each section is going to count for. I know that 20% of my grade will consist of my homework and quiz average. So that should be significantly larger than my class participation section. So this one was homework and quizzes. And the little yellow guy. Was participation at 5%. So now, if you look at that circle graph, you really have a better idea of how much weight each category carries versus coming over here and just looking at the list typed out. So let's go use it. <coughs> we have questions about Joel's day, and we're going to use this pie chart, the circle graph, to help us answer the questions. So the first question says, what single activity does Joelle spend most of her time doing? Well, most of her time means I want the biggest section. And I only want one section. I don't get to add up multiple ones because it said single activity. Well, it very much appears like Joelle spends most of her time throughout the day sleeping. Let's try that again. There we go. Does she spend more time doing school-related activities or sleeping? Well, let's see. I'm going to go down to the bottom and make some notes. Sleeping was 36%. School-related activities. Let's see, she spends 27% of her day at school, so I would definitely say that counts. Then she spends 11% of her day doing homework, completely school-related. 
And she spends 4% of her day riding the bus to and from school. So we can include that one. If I add those up, 27 and 11 is 38, 39, 40, 41, 42%. So she spends 42% of her day doing things that are completely school related. And then 36% of her day sleeping. So it looks like she spends more time on school related activities. How many hours per day does Joelle spend doing homework? So I'm going to go find the homework section. Looks like Joelle spends 11% of her day doing homework. But that doesn't tell me a whole lot about hours and we were asked for hours. Well, I know that one whole day is 24 hours. So really what we need to find is 11% of 24 hours. Now you've got a couple of options. We can do this the old-fashioned way. We can do 0.11 times 24 hours. That comes out to be 2.6. Or, and this is a trick I haven't shown you yet, in your Desmos Scientific Calculator, you can actually type in 11%, it gives you the of, 24. And there's your 2.6 hours. It is totally up to you which method you use. Either way, we know this girl spends 2.6 hours out of her day doing homework. Let's go take a look at a line graph. These you should be really familiar with. You've used them all throughout um, probably maybe eighth grade on. And whether you realize it or not, these happen everywhere. These are especially helpful when we want to show changes or trends over time. These might be things like growth charts. Your doctor's offices will definitely track your weight from the time you were born. This happens a lot in the stock market. So looking at line graphs gives you a great picture of how things change over time. When we do these, we still have the X and Y axis. The X axis, remember that's our horizontal axis is our independent quantity. This for our um, 
line graphs is typically going to be time. We're still going to have a y-axis. Remember, that's the vertical axis, and this is going to be our dependent quantity. And this could be anything from height to weight to money. Um, it just depends on the problem. So we had a veterinarian who is tracking the weight of baleen from April through August, and the results are shown below. We just said that we would use the x-axis to measure time, so that means our months are going to go along the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and set that up. I'm going to let April start right there. That would be May, June, July, and August. That means our dependent quantity is going to be Bailey's weight. So we'll start this at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is weight in pounds. Along the bottom, we had months. And our graph needs a title. So we will track Bailey's growth. Now it's time to plot our data. So in the month of April, Bailey the puppy weighed one pound. In May, she still hadn't gained any weight. She still weighs one pound. In June, she gained a, two, gained a pound. In July, she weighed five pounds. And in August, she weighed eight pounds. Now you can't have a line graph without some lines. So I'm gonna connect my dots with lines. There is my line graph showing the change in Bailey the puppy's weight over the course of one, two, three, four, five months. So that's our line graph. <coughs> this last type of graph is going to be a stem and leaf plot. This one might be a little bit different. It might be new. When we talk about a stem and leaf plot, we're not talking about drawing a bunch of trees. What we're going to do is we are going to look at every single one of the digits in our data list, every single one of the numbers in our data list, I should say. And we are going to pull off a stem and a leaf. The leaf is going to be the last digit. Usually, this is the ones digit. This 
stem is everything to the left of the ones digit. So what I'm going to do is I am going to set up my stem column first. Most, all but one of my data entries, all except that 100, is going to be a digit in the tens. So I'm going to go and find my lowest number in this case, my lowest test score, the 22. And I'm going to peel off the leaf. That's the two. And the stem is in the tens place. When I write it in my chart, the stem goes to the left of the divider. The leaf goes to the right of the divider. Now, when we do these, we have to categorize our numbers. We have to sort them. I don't think I have any more in the 20s. So now I'm going to go look to the 30s. I know my stem is going to be that tens digit, the 3. So let's see, I have a 33, I'm trying to find them in order, and a 36. I already have the 30. That three in the stem spot tells me I'm dealing with a 30. All I need to rewrite is the six from the 36. My next stem is probably going to be in the 40s. There's a 45 and a 45. So my stem is going to be a four. Now since I have a 45 and a 45, I have two fives for the leaves. Let me find some 50s. It looks like the smallest one I have in the 50s is a 55, and there are two of those. So there's one 55, there's another 55. Oh, and a 58. I'm gonna go look through the 60s. I have a 63, 62, 62, 69, 67, and 66. The smallest of those is the 62. So I'm going to put my two first to make the 62. Then a three for 63. Oh, I had two 62s. So I'm going to slide this over. Now I have two 62s. 63. I have a 66. So I need 60. Six. And then sixty seven. And 
and then 69. I'm going to go see what I've got in the 70s range. I've got a 78, a 73, 77, and 75. So putting those in order, I have 73 first, and then the 5. And then 77 and 78. And I go check out my 80s. 81, 81. I've got an 80. And that looks like it. So there's the 8 for the 80. I had a flat out 80. So I'm going to put a zero for the 80 and a one for the 81. I need to look for 90s. Here's a 99 and a 94 and a 95 and 99 and a 95. So I'll get my stem down here for the 90s group. It looks like my lowest one in the 90s group was the 94. And then two 95s, so I need two fives. And then two 99s, so I need a nine and a nine. Now my last one is a little bit different because the only thing I haven't used just yet is the 100. Its leaf is still in the ones place. That means its stem is the 10. So I need a stem of 10 and a leaf of zero. So that is your stem plot. And we're gonna take a look and see what we can tell from our graph. What are the minimum and maximum test grades? That means we wanna take a look at the highest number and the lowest number. Well, this is a super handy thing about stem plots. They make it really easy to identify the minimum and maximum values. My minimum value is 22. My maximum value is 100. Now let's see I didn't have that 100 sitting down there. Let's pretend that this was my last row on my stem, prop, stem plot. My highest value then would be 99. I take the stem and the last leaf, and put them together. How many students scored between 50 and 80 inclusive? Inclusive means we're going to count the 50s and we're going to count the 80s. Well, my 50s are 
or in this row, I have 55, 55, and 58. So that's three. If I go look for my 60s, I get 62, 62, 63, 66, 67, and 69. That's seven. I'm gonna count my 70s. I have four, gray, 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 So that means I only have one right there. Well, seven and three is 10 and four is 14. And one more is 15. So 15 students scored between 50 and 80. The last question is what letter grade, A, B, C, D, or F, occurs most frequently? Well, a D is in the 60 range. A C is in the 70 range. A B is in the 80 range. A's are 90s and 100s. I'm hoping we don't have to go count the F's. So in the D's, I have one, two, three, four, five, six students scoring in the D range. I have four C's, two B's, one, two, three, four, five, six A's. So that means the letter grade occurring most frequently is actually two letter grades, and that's A and D. Which brings me to the second really nifty property of the stem and leaf plot. It is easy to determine the most frequently occurring values. Whether it's an interval, so the letter grade that we just talked about, or if I go through and look at individual numbers that occur twice or more, I have two 55s, I have two 45s, I have two 62s, and two 95s. So that makes it very easy for those numbers to stand out. That is the end of our line graphs and circle graphs and stem plots. Be sure to send any questions you have my way.